that I missed on the objectives that I realized I missed, and they're here. So this will just be in addition to your notes. So I'll tell. I will hopefully remember when we go to that. Okay. So the term prokaryote. Prokaryote is a noun that defines cells that do not have a nucleus. In terms of biomass on the earth, meaning the amount of weight of living things on the earth, the prokaryotes far exceed the eukaryotes. Far, far, far. Thing is, is that most of them we can't see, but they're there. And so if we added up all their weight, they would just far exceed all of the organisms that you can see. The prokaryotes, cells without a nucleus, are two of the three domains. The domain bacteria and the domain archaea or archaea. So terms again, prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. Prokaryotic means cells that do not have a nucleus. Pro means before. Karyotic refers to nucleus. So the word, a lot of times the words in biology have a base in Latin or Greek, and they tell you a little bit of information about it. Pro, before, karyotic nucleus, means that these cells evolved before cells with a nucleus evolved. They are typically very simple in structure, they do not have many organelles. They have been around for billions of years. So just because we are very complex doesn't mean we are stronger, doesn't mean they are weaker. We don't like to use those terms again in biology because what does strength mean? It's an ambiguous term in terms of like what you're thinking in your mind. So because of their simplicity, it gives them many advantages over us being so complex that they don't have as much DNA, they don't have as many genes, which means that when the environment changes, the likelihood that they have a mutation that allows them to survive and be selected for in the environment of that change is much higher than us. So kind of an interesting mindset in terms of evolution. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. They are typically much larger in size, much more complex. And when we're talking about complexity, a few things, they have more organelles and they have more DNA, more genes. You mean true karyotic nucleus. These are cells that have a true, a real nucleus. Phylogenetic tree. So we're going to reflect on this again. When you look at this phylogenetic tree, a few things I want to go over again that when we look the base of this tree shows us that there is a common ancestor to all living things. Remember that these two have a branch here which means that they share with an ancestor. An ancestor gave rise to the two domains that are prokaryotic. So the common ancestor is prokaryotic. It evolved before the nucleus evolved. So some of this is just a little review of what we talked about in evolution. And anywhere that you have a branch, call that common ancestor, 
you have a common ancestor. The bacteria and the archaea, they share a common ancestor. The archaea and the eukarya, eukarya, share a common ancestor. Animals share the most common ancestor of the other kingdoms with the fungi. Fungi share a common ancestor with the plants, likely green algae, something that had a common ancestor of green algae and plants had similar characteristics. The protists group share common ancestors more closely with the plants. So again, remember, wherever you have a branching, it means those two groups share a common ancestor. Common ancestry, go back to evolutionary relationships. And so again, the bacteria and the archaea share that prokaryotic common ancestor, which means that if you have a common ancestor, you share an evolutionary relationship. Let's look at the shapes of the prokaryotes. So first shape, circular. You looked under the microscope and you saw some prokaryotic cells and they were round. We would call them spherical, spheres, or cocci. The rods, rod shapes, are called bacilli. And when their corkscrew or spirals, they're called spirilla. They kind of look like snakes when you look under the microscope, but they're really like this. Kind of like DNA, how DNA also is a corkscrew or a spiral shape. Under the microscope, they look like squiggles because you can't see that spiral looking down on it. So again, round are cocci, rod are bacilli, corkscrew, spirals, spirilla. I know you, I don't think I have that in your notes, so if you want to label those again, cocci, bacilli, and spirilla. round, rod, helix, spiral. All right, so let's think just kind of more hypothetically. In which of these situations would you find prokaryotes? Yeah, they're everywhere, everywhere. Does that mean that it's bad, that they're everywhere? For the most part, it's a really good thing. They're very, very, very important and helpful to us. Let's talk a little bit about their reproduction means. The reproduction means in which they typically utilize is called fission. Fission means to split in two. The cell grows to twice its size and then forms a cell wall and makes two genetically identical spring from a parent cell. Simplest form of reproduction. This benefits them because they're super simple in structure. They don't have a lot of organelles to copy. Their size is small, so to grow to twice their size, not that hard, won't take that long to do. And because they don't have a ton of DNA, it's easy for them to copy all of their DNA. On average, it takes about 20 minutes for a prokaryote to do this. 20 minutes. So think about, for example, a bacterium that you might be infected with is strep bacteria, something that gives certain so you wake up in the morning and you feel that little like scratchiness, right? And by the end of the day, it's 10 o'clock at night, and you're just, you feel awful. 
And the reason being is that one or a few bacteria get in your throat and they start to do this. They start to do fission. Two, four, eight, 16. And the growth goes like this, exponential. And so that's why as they are reproducing, they're giving off chemicals that make you feel bad. And it can happen pretty quickly. In the course of a day, they can go from just a few to millions in one day. Right? Humans, it takes us generations and generations and generations to get to millions. So it's kind of impressive. So what it looks like is like this. That they grow to twice their size and they split in two. Good or bad, it can cause easy mutations to occur. So for them, if they have to copy one ring of DNA, it's called the nucleoid, plus other tiny rings of DNA that float around in their cytoplasm called plasmids, copying that in 20 minutes is still, this amount of DNA in 20 minutes might be like copying your notes for the day. <laughs> if I told you, you have 20 minutes to write out all the notes for today, do you think you would make a lot of mistakes? Yes. So, being that it gives a lot of potential Copying this volume of DNA so quickly makes for good potential to create mutations. And so, you know, remembering a little bit about evolution is that mutations are just a mistake in the copying of DNA. It's not intentional, but it's because it happens so quickly that the potential to make those mistakes or mutations is high. Mutations can be really, really bad. A mutation could happen and copying this to the offspring that makes the offspring immediately die off. Could be a mutation that doesn't allow them to replicate the lipids in the cell wall. So if they don't have that protective cell wall, that leaves the offspring very vulnerable and that could kill off the offspring very quickly. Could be a mutation that doesn't really serve them in the environment right now, but maybe later could help them or hurt them. Or it could be a mutation that immediately helps them survive better in their environment. So there's one of those three options and a mutation, but a lot of times the mutations will just be something that doesn't help them right now. It's not selected for. But later in life, the environment might change and then they're like, oh, look at me, I'm lucky. I had a, a gene that allows me to survive in the presence of this environment. One of the other things that prokaryotes can do in terms of sharing their DNA is not just in reproduction, they can do what's called, and this is super cool, horizontal gene transfer. HGT. with 
each other. I'm not exactly sure why they do this, but they can. And in sharing these plasmids, what if, and a lot of times what we see is that the genes for antibiotic resistance of different antibiotics are on these little plasmids, and they share them. So they share the resistance for different kinds of antibiotics between different species of prokaryotes. Crazy. Dangerous for us. Good for them, right? Helps them to survive better. There's a lot of need for research about this horizontal gene transfer situation. There's tons of research available because as more of these random mutations for antibiotic resistance come about in our world, you have more prokaryotes being resistant to the antibiotics we have, which means that we need more new antibiotics to combat them. Pharmaceutical companies are continuously doing this research. It doesn't yield them a ton of money, though, because they have to change the formulas for antibiotics over time as there's more resistance. So if this is something you like puzzles, a great place to work on puzzles, great career path. Oh, you guys don't have some, maybe some of you do and some of you don't. So um, if you want to take a picture of this, because you don't have this slide, I apologize. This is another objective I added in. Go ahead and take a picture, unless you've written it all down already. Yeah, very fascinating field of research. So what this is called, it's called conjugation, when they do horizontal gene transfer. And so kind of like my picture that I do here, it's not mating, because when we talk about mating in biology, it means the union of sperm and egg. So it's not mating, they don't mate together, but it's kind of like mating in that there's some attachment between two organisms and there's a sharing of DNA. So that's why we call it mating because it's not biological mating, but they are transferring DNA. And again, clearly you can see these are not the same species. They are both rod-shaped, but they're not the same species. So a couple of ways that we know that they do this is that from their cell walls, they will extend out their cell membranes underneath the cell wall and bridge, like what you saw in that last picture or like my picture here. And they will share the plasmids of them. Some extensions on the surface of cells are called pili, sometimes people call them P -I -P -I -I. P -I -I. again, however you want to say it. If it is a pili that does this HGT, then it's called a sex pilus because it's kind of like a penis, kind of, so they call it a sex pilus. And very good strategy for survival because they can add new gene combinations to other species. Typically, a species cannot share DNA with a different species and typically even if you're in the same genus, but not the same species, you typically can't even mate together. Remember those reproductive isolation mechanisms? Is that you're reproductively isolated even if you're in the same genus, but a different species within the same genus. So this is pretty amazing, this horizontal gene transfer ability. So what do we do? By what process are bacteria able to gain resistance to antibiotic. Do they form endospores? 
meiosis, conjugation, sexual reproduction, or mitosis? Good, conjugation. So C is correct. Excellent. So just a little review. Okay, think about this sentence. A pathogen can be a bacterium, but not all bacteria are pathogens. What this means is that some bacteria are pathogens, but not all bacteria are pathogens. So in the whole scope of bacteria, the majority of them are beneficial. They might do things like decompose, or they might produce vitamins that we need in our body. So most bacteria do good things. A small, small, small percentage of the bacteria species that exist are pathogenic. Not that many are. And that's a big misconception in our world is that we're so focused on, even you know, before the pandemic, using the hand sanitizer, right? Gotta get the bacteria off of me. Well, for the most part, we didn't really need this all the time. Definitely during maybe like flu season when the flu virus and the cold viruses are being transmitted a lot, it's good to do that. But for the rest of the year, we're pretty safe for most pathogenic bacteria or viruses. So let's talk about how many are out there. So I said that there's more biomass of prokaryotes on the earth than eukaryotes. So how much? You took a spoon of soil and you looked at it under the microscope and you started counting them. Well, you'd have to plate them out. Yeah. Process. But regardless, there's billions, billions in one spoonful of soil. In our body, this is probably even a low number. There's trillions. They are all over us. They are all inside us. Again, the majority of them are useful to us. Majority. All right, a little bit about the archaea or archaea. Most of that domain are prokaryotes that do really extreme things. They often are called extreme environments. They live in the most harsh environments on the earth. They can survive in places that other organisms are not adapted to survive. There's many different species down in the hydrothermal vents, so deep down in the ocean, closer to the core of the earth. The closer you are to the core of the earth, the warmer it gets, because the core of the earth is molten and hot. So we have them that live right where boiling water shoots out. And they're like, cool, that's great. They survive fine. In addition, you see this, a lot of this is toxic chemicals that come out of the core of the earth. There are, back, there are archaea down there that are producers. There's no sunlight, but they're producers called chemosynthesis, and they use chemicals from the core of the earth instead of sunlight to produce energy that the rest of the organisms in the ecosystem are on. Very different than what we know on the surface of the Earth. The other thing about water is water's heavy. Right, if you've got a gallon of water and you carry it around all day, that would be a chore. Imagine thousands of feet of water, meters and meters of water on top of you. It would crush you. They can withstand that heaviness too. They can live in places that are frozen. So there's a lot of research going on that as glaciers melt due to climate change, what's going to come out of there? In the Dead Sea, where salt concentrations are extremely high and most organisms would dehydrate, they can live there. So lots of really amazing 
add up these. So now we're going to talk about pathogens. This is where your piece of paper comes in handy. So, uh, wait, is it what? Oh. Some of it's the same, and some of it, some of it I added in some new words here and there. So um, stick to your paper for right now. I know it's a little bit in the notebook. Okay, so a pathogen, by definition, is a disease-causing bacteria. These are in the domain bacteria. They synthesize some kind of chemical in which organisms around them that chemical will suffer. We call the suffering disease. They cause disease-like symptoms. The main way for us to protect ourselves against any pathogen, even some real crazy scary ones, is wash your hands. 20 seconds with soap. After the pandemic is all over, please continue to wash your hands for 20 seconds. I will sit now every time I have a habit now, of every time I go into a restroom or in between lecture and lab, every about hour I'm in public or so, or if I feel like I touch a lot of things in a public space, I will go wash my hands and I will put a lot of soap on and then for 20 seconds, and I sit and I count one, two, three, four. Like I'm gonna go do surgery. I get in between my fingernails, I get my in between my fingers, and I really get my hands going. It's funny because when I'm in public still, now people have gone back to the soap, turn on the water, out. I'll have four people wash their hands next to me by the time I'm done doing once. And a lot of times when I'm doing this in a public space, people are like, do that, and then they go, oh. They get more soap, and they keep doing it. So those habits will keep you healthier. If you don't have the ability to wash your hands, alcohol-based sanitizer is good to use. Don't put your hands to your face, because We'll talk about the immune system. Anywhere you have a portal, I call it a portal to the outside world. Eyes, nose, mouth, ears. Face has a lot of those portals where we get things inside of our body. So don't touch your face. Just get in the habit of not touching your face. When you broken my husband of this. No. Vampire, right? Actually put your hand on your shoulder so that it brings your elbow close to your mouth so you are not just going like because <laughs> it's all just coming out. You want this to cover your mouth and nose. So that if you're carrying something in your lungs, it's here. You typically don't touch this, right? So close. Hug yourself. Give yourself a pat on the back when you cough. Those habits will keep you healthier in general. Let's talk about some examples. Clostridium botulinum causes botulism. This is lethal. Typically, this bacteria is transmitted via food and grows in, is selected for in cans that are dented. If you ever go to the grocery store and you're picking out some canned food and there's a dented one, don't buy it. Even if it's like it's a nickel as opposed to $2, don't buy it. The paralysis is caused by poisons that are released in the digestive system. Our digestive system has a lot of blood vessels that surround our digestive system so that it can digestive. Blood vessels can extract nutrients 
from our digestive system. So that if there are poisons in your stomach, they go into your circulatory system quickly. Just like alcohol, you drink alcohol, it goes into your digestive system quickly. So the bacteria in the food will leach these poisons, and then those poisons get carried by the blood throughout your body. Our circulatory system is in contact with every cell in your body. So what that poison will do is it will paralyze all of your cells. When your cell is paralyzed, when your cells get paralyzed, it causes them to shut down. They can't do their jobs. And so when you're thinking about like brain cells, heart cells, very important things, kidney cells, your circulatory cells themselves, those things will cause you to die quickly. This poison, very smart researchers found out or they started to think, well, hmm, if this causes paralysis, what we can do, because we are such a vain society, is that we can take that poison and we can modify it a little bit, and then people can inject it into places where they make these faces a lot, right? You're thinking, you're smiling, you can inject them into the muscles of your face where you make certain expressions that over time cause wrinkles, so you can paralyze the muscles. It's called Botox. So the derivative of the botulism poison has allowed for the beauty industry to make billions of dollars in Botox. See, lots of research out there. Tetanus, this will paralyze just the area that is infected. So a rusty nail, walking around without shoes outside, step on a rusty nail, you get a cut. In that cut, those bacterium, a clostridium tetani start to reproduce. They start to do this exponential growth, and they start releasing a poison into that area, which paralyzes the cells in that area, which means that the immune system and start to heal that area. So they can work on these things relatively quickly. Time. Tetanus shots, there is a vaccine against this bacterium that you should get every 10 years. So I know on the nines, every 2009, 19, 29, that's when I get my tetanus shot. So that's something that definitely, as there's more garbage around in the world, and especially some of you who may be field biologists, you should really be on top of when you get your tetanus shot. Or I know a lot of you are going to be working in hospitals and labs. It's another place that you could get needle sticks or you can get cut by some kind of lab equipment. It's really important for you all to know what year do I get my tetanus vaccine. diseases. We are right in the middle of one of them. COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. What we mean by that, zoo means animal. As I mentioned before, when we're talking about different species of prokaryotes, is that they typically cannot meet together. We are reproductively isolated from other organisms. However, sometimes some bacterial diseases or viral diseases, I know we're talking about prokaryotes, but the viruses kind of go into this category also of zoonotic diseases, is that sometimes these diseases can call it, jump the species barrier, meaning that even though we are reproductively isolated from a bat, for example, a chicken, a pig, they could get a disease and somebody working in the environment of chickens, like a chicken farm, for example, or working in a market where they're selling chickens, is that they can contract a disease. And it's rare, but it happens. And it's happening more and more. There are 150 worldwide zoonotic diseases now, and 2.2 million deaths 
climate change accelerates a lot of this. So climate change, if we really looked at the effects in terms of evolution and natural selection, climate change is touching everywhere. It's causing all kinds of issues in almost any realm of living things. It is believed that climate change is having issues with every species on the planet. Okay, so what are some of the U.S. zoonotic diseases? A lot of these are going to start to ring some bells. You're going to be like, oh yeah, zoonotic influenza, Salmonella oh, sal salmonellosis, West Nile virus, plague, emerging coronaviruses, COVID-19, SARS and MERS. So before COVID, some of you may have heard about MERS or SARS. These are all coronaviruses. Rabies, brucellosis, Lyme disease has been around a long time. Deer, ticks, humans. How many of you have ever had a strep throat? Oh, a lot of you, yeah. So strep bacteria, that's from a member of what we call the group A streptococcus, streptococcus genus. There's a lot of different species, and in this specific group A, there's a lot of pathogens that cause many different diseases. One of the things about strep throat is that for those of you who have never gotten this awful, right? Strep is awful. It just, your throat is on fire sore for a week right you get the flu or you get a cold usually your throat's sore for like a day and it's super annoying because everything you do you breathe you swallow constantly you can't get away from that pain imagine a week of it for those of you who've never gotten one a strep throat two weeks of it it's miserable some people are more susceptible to the specific genus and species of the streptococcus bacteria that causes strep throat, some of us are just more susceptible to getting sick from it. It's super common. Streptococcus is a non-pathogenic species that are very, very helpful to us and our world, but it also has pathogenic species. Some of the Diseases that are caused are real minor. Like strep throat doesn't kill you. It's super annoying, but it's not deadly in most cases. Pneumonia. We're seeing a lot of pairing in hospitals of people with compromised immunity or Corbin more morbid. Uh, Corbin. Now I, the words are. Um, with, I'm gonna say, other factors that allow them to be more susceptible to getting sick from COVID. Like pneumonia, sometimes will go along with people who are susceptible to the pneumonia, kind of streptococcus, they get COVID and then they die. Or it exaggerates the uh, coronavirus disease. Tooth decay supposed to brush your teeth twice a day because some of you and it's all a lot of this is genetic in terms of your susceptibility to contracting a more extreme version of some of the, these diseases and some of you may be just completely immune to getting sick from some of them tooth decay is something that in between just to floss at least once a day because these bacteria get in between the teeth. And that's usually where cavities develop first, is the tight spaces in between two teeth. And so not only brushing, you want to brush for two minutes. There's another minute thing. Two minutes is a long time to brush your teeth. It's great for all kinds of toothbrushes that press a button and it buzzes for two minutes. It buzzes every 30 seconds so that you can get this section, this section, this section, this section. If not, there's little timers. You got a phone, 
Put two minutes on there. Get all four suction. Yes, back. Back teeth. We usually miss. A lot of cavities in these back teeth here. And the in-between teeth. Floss. Rinse. All of those things are important in fighting. Tooth decay. My family, I have always been really, really neurotic about brushing the teeth. And I still have a mouthful of cavities. More susceptible to this kind of streptococcus decaying my teeth. Rheumatic fever, cellulitis. Cellulitis is a deep cell infection. Uh, cellulitis goes along with many of the antibiotic system antibiotic wide spectrum resistant bacteria. You can get real deep infections. Toxic shock syndrome, not all of them, there's a few different versions. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about necrotizing fasciitis in a second. This bacteria, because it's so common, is easily spread from person to person. A lot of times we carry it in our mouth and nose. And so you cough, you breathe heavy, it's out in the air. So let's talk about this one. Not super common. I always like when they say it's rare. But it still affects 500 to 1,000 Americans per year. But it's rare. It's not super common. If you contract it, you have a 15% likelihood you're going to die of it. So you can, even though this infection, again, spreads quickly, exponential growth real quick, but if it is caught quickly, Meaning that there is an accurate diagnosis, which this is getting to be a lot more, um, there's a lot more education and medical professionals now about what does necrotizing fasciitis look like. So people are catching it more quickly these days than they have in the past. So that accurate diagnosis is really important with a rapid mass spectrum antibiotic treatment. And that's depending on how bad it is, you might need immediate surgery, and a lot of times it's just getting in there and using a tool to fry the tissues that are infected or removing them. Biofilms. We're going to hear more and more about this as well. A lot of research needs to be done on biofilms. Biofilms are made from bacterial groups. Now get this, it's just a complex polysaccharide covering. And these polysaccharides start to bond. Poly means long or many carbohydrates, polysaccharides. So you have chains of polysaccharides. They become interwoven, kind of like the hyphae. You visualize that into the mycelium, but more complex. And so they can make this barrier where bacteria are, and they're not exactly sure of the mechanism, but bacteria are recruited into this group. And not only do they recruit one kind of bacteria, but they kind of recruit anybody who's around to come join their community in this biofilm. And once that biofilm is made and they are encapsulated in there, the biofilm can withstand antibiotics that typically the bacteria inside would die from, it takes 500 times to 5,000 times the dosage of an antibiotic that would typically kill them to get inside this biofilm. If you took that much antibiotic, you'd die because it would kill off pretty much most of the bacteria that are good in your body. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be more, but you can't, you can't use that much more because it would just really kill off everything that's good or a lot of what's good in the body. So these are tough to do. Many species can be in there. The other thing that these biofilms do.
is they kind of look like a Hershey's Kiss that after they're in here for a while, they shoot out like lava, a bunch of bacteria that they've reproduced and then they close back up again. And then these ones go and make more biofilms. There's a ton of research abilities in here. Infections don't usually happen very quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. You definitely, people will need intervention. Like I said, there's a lot more research that needs to be done because hypothetically, so a lot of researchers are hypothesizing that many diseases and chronic infections are due to biofilm. So they're looking for those connections. So again, here's a whole area of research in medicine that's really, really important. And I think now you go back, right? Yeah, 163 notes. Back to your notebook on 163. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these two things, intestinal bacteria and foodborne illness. So most, most again, most of the bacteria in our body are good, but sometimes there are strains or species that produce a toxin that are bad. So let's talk about this term. The micro biome. A biome is an ecosystem. A micro refers to all of the microbes that live in an onio. This is another field of medical research. There's tons of work going on. You are born sterile. So you're born without all of the important microbes in your body. And you, as soon as you're born, or even on your way to being born, you accumulate your microbiome. And the environment that you live in will influence what your microbiome looks like, what the diversity of it is. So here's an interesting thing, is that because, you know, one of the things about our world is that with medical intervention of births, more children are being born via C-section, so they're cut and removed out instead of being vaginally born. Now, in terms of microbiome research, what they do know is that kids who are born via C-section miss out on the vagina microbiome getting all over their body. You might be like, that's disgusting. I don't even want to think about it. But it's very important that babies are born through the vagina that seeds or it adds to the majority of your microbiome right off the bat. You're breathing it in, right? Going down the vagina, breathing in. You're getting it all over your body because you're just smashed in there. And so you're having this microbiome that if you are C-section maybe, you don't get it. Perhaps, yes. So if you were born C-section, um, and, and so it depends on, it depends on the, a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of people who are now doing, when kids are born C-section, they swab the mother's vagina, and they rub that swab inside their mouth, on their eyes, up their nose, all over their body. And again, sounds disgusting, but it's super important. So it depends on if your team that you were born via did that or not. They do find that kids who have allergies, there's an association between C-section and allergies. Now, we don't know exactly if there's a correlation, but there's definitely data that you are more likely to have allergies if you were born via C-section. Um, it's, you know, 
it's hard to make these direct correlations. Um, and plus everything is, we're talking about individuals as opposed to populations, and we try and make those correlations to a population, but then individuals are, think different things happen to individuals. Um, other things can happen though, like if you played, if you were a kid who liked to go outside and sit in the yard and dig around in the grass and play in the dirt, there's a correlation that if you played in the dirt, remember how many millions, billions of microbes are in dirt? Dirt's not necessarily dirty, but dirt, they found that kids who play, sit and play in the dirt, have a more diverse and healthier microbiome than kids who Because there's a lot of things that the more exposure you have to different microbiomes, typically the healthier you are. Um, there's a lot of correlation between people who don't eat meat. Vegetarians and vegans have a healthier microbiome than those who eat meat. There's also, I thought one more. It'll come to me, I'm sure. Okay, so. Lots and lots of research there on the microbiome. Also, oh, the other one was pets. They have found that people who have pets get exposed to the pet's microbiome, and they are typically healthier, too. A lot of it is the diversity that you are exposed to in the world might mean a healthier microbiome. However, like meat, the more meat you eat, the less healthy your microbiome. So here's like a curiosity of people who do keto diets who are eating a lot more meat than people who are like vegan. The keto diet, there's benefits to it for certain people, like with cancer that feeds quickly off of sugar a keto diet is really good for that type of cancer because you're limiting the carbohydrates that would feed the cancer. But it's specific kinds of diseases that benefit from keto. So keto often is looked as a diet to keep you healthy and your weight, but will that be beneficial to you and your genome in terms of cancers, for example, or diabetes or heart disease? Um, so there's a lot, lots of, lots of research going on with the microbiome as well. So there's a lot of like, what's the cause and what's the effect? We are genetically predisposed to certain diseases, and then our microbiome creates a selection factor for us. So your diet creates a selection factor into what? diseases might be activated for you. There's a lot of research that says your microbiome may cause a disease, or you may have the genetics and exposure to the microbiome may cause the disease. So they're not really sure which way it goes, and it probably goes both ways. That making a healthier microbiome will make you less susceptible to disease. So an auto, this is another one, like autoimmune disease, for example, they're definitely seeing that some connection. So for example, people who suffer from diseases of the digestive system, like Crohn's disease or IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, we're seeing a lot more and more of that. And this is a, such an unfortunate name that they gave this process. Would any of you just think like, if I said, want to have a fecal transplant? I'm guessing none of you would be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. It sounds really disgusting, right? But it's really not. It's not a fecal transplant. I conjure up that someone is going to take their feces and put it somewhere into my body. And I am so grossed out. That's not what they do. What they do is they take the feces of a very healthy person who they believe has a healthy microbiome 
and they put it in a centrifuge machine, and it's a machine that takes uh, liquid into these little encapsulated, topped off, like little tiny Tupperware containers, and then it spins it really, 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 really fast, and so that heavy things are going to sink and light things come to the top. So all of the non-digestible matter of the feces goes down and the microbiome floats up. And then they take a pipette and they suck off the microbiome and they may do a couple of things. They might put it into a kind of like pill shaped thing, like a suppository and they put it up the anus or further, maybe even up to the small intestine. Um, or you might swallow it, swallow a pill but you are not getting feces in your body. You're getting the microbiome of the feces. And so maybe that, I thought, why don't we call it like a microbiome transplant? Not a fecal transplant, that sounds gross. But they're finding a lot of success with people with Crohn's disease, for example, getting a fecal transplant, a fecal transplant. and becoming healthier. Their sim symptoms are alleviated. And um, these symptoms can be pretty awful for people to deal with. So again, microbiome, a lot of research going on to cure diseases, especially immune diseases. Let's talk about another group of bacteria, Escherichia coli. E. coli is the more common name. This is one of the most common bacteria that are inside of your digestive system. They are mostly really, really good and important to your health. Sometimes there are strains or members of the E. coli that produce toxins that are not healthy for us. And that's what causes foodborne illness. So here's another kind of like misnomer in terms of like think of E. coli and think bad. A lot of us just think, oh, that's a bad bacteria. It's really mostly not. So let's talk a little bit about foodborne illnesses, meaning that you get sick from eating something. Okay, so beef. Remember your assignment about the chicken farms and the antibiotic resistance? And there's a question about the number of antibiotic resistant bacteria found in organic chickens as opposed to conventional. Cheap meat, meat that is not organic or not grass fed or pastured, which is usually more expensive because it takes a lot more energy to make sure that they are fed more naturally. Other meat, you go to the grocery store and you're going to make chili, beef chili, and you're like, I don't have a lot of money. I'm going to buy the cheapest meat out there. That meat is very, very likely to be made in a factory farm. And so what they're doing is they have a huge factory and it's just packed with cows. And they pack them, pack them, pack them in. And as you read, they have like feed troughs and they put antibiotics in there in case the animals get sick and that it is more likely for those animals to pass on antibiotic resistant bacteria in your food. So when they process factory farmed beef, for example, what they will do is they will slice the neck of the cow and so you there's very large arteries and veins in the neck, and then they hang them upside down, and it drains all the blood out. And so on these big hooks, they hang the animals, and then the animals go from room to room, and people who work there, they start to cut off the meat from the cow, and they put them in bins. There's a lot of pressure on people who work in these factory farms to do things quickly so that the company can make more money at a faster pace, big profits. So 
So these cows are coming in on a conveyor chain above, and these people are cutting really, really quickly. The meat, a lot of the meat, like ribs, for example, beef ribs, is here, close to the digestive system. So as they are quickly trying to cut away ribs, for example, that are close to the digestive system, the likelihood that they are going to nick the stomach or the small intestines, pretty good. It's expected that they will. So the USDA and the FDA, they are going to test 10% of the meat for specific foodborne E. coli strains. 10% of the meat though. So they're just going like, eh, the likelihood of the factory having a mistake. We're gonna rely on 10% of the meat, but not look at the other 90%. That's a strategy that has to be done to sell our food quickly and cheaply. So every so often we have food outbreaks. You can see the statistics. 70,000 people per year get sick and at least 60 people die a year from cheap meat. What this bacteria does, so let's say that you're gonna make chili and you don't cook it long enough or a burger you want a medium rare burger which means that that burger is not cooked a hundred percent of the way or you go somewhere and you order chili and they didn't cook that meat high enough to kill all the bacteria on there that can make you sick what that bacteria produces is they produce a toxin that goes into your digestive system, and it makes you just start to vomit, have diarrhea, but it also causes intestinal bleeding, and you can suffer from internal bleeding out. So there's a lot of symptoms. Also, that toxin can shut down organs. There's a lot of organs in the middle of your body that are close to your digestive system as well as, remember, all of those circulatory vessels are pulling into the circulatory system. So when these toxins are made, they can be dispersed throughout your body very quickly. Oh. One other thing that can happen is that it seems like every few years that some kind of lettuce has these E. coli on there, but if these E. coli are living in cattle, how do they get to lettuce? Well, there might be a lettuce farm down the road from one of these cattle farms and water that leaches out into a stream nearby could then go onto the spinach farm or the uh, romaine farm and infect plants that are nearby. Right, let's talk about a couple of good ones. Nitrogen fixing bacteria. When this term fixing is used, fix means to attach or grab we cannot grab nitrogen from our atmosphere. Nitrogen makes up about 79% of our atmosphere, yet we cannot put it into our body. We breathe it in and we breathe it out. We can fix oxygen, but we can't fix nitrogen. So there are bacteria that live in the nodules of roots they make nodules in roots of plants, which are basically like they grow into a group exponentially, and then it makes the root kind of bulge out. And that's called a root nodule. What those bacteria can do is they can trap nitrogen or fix it, pass it onto the plant. Plants get eaten. We can then absorb that nitrogen. Nitrogen is a really important part of our DNA, our RNA, and our proteins. So we all, all of us, rely on these nitrogen fixing bacteria. Every organism needs nitrogen. And everything on Earth relies on these. If climate change affects these kinds of nitrogen 
fixing bacteria, every species on the planet is compromised. So it's another one of the many, many reasons we need to keep our environment healthy and keep soil healthy. All right, I think this may be the last bacteria are decomposers. So the decomposers are recyclers of nutrients. And when we're talking about nutrients, we're talking about atoms. But they can recycle carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens, phosphorus, etc. from dead things or the waste of, of living things. So they can break that stuff down and take those put them back into the soil so the producers can, when they are bringing water from their roots in the xylem, they can also absorb these important nutrients. So through the xylem, with water, nutrients can be dispersed from the roots all the way up to the leaves. Oh, no, sorry, this is the last one, I think. Bioremediation. These are bacteria that can take complex... Do you guys have this? Yeah, okay. They can take complex molecules, even poisonous or destructive molecules, and make them not toxic. There was a comparison between back in the 1980s, there was a oil spill up north. Exxon Valdez is a famous oil spill. They treated this oil spill with bioremediation bacteria. They used bioremediation. And the ecosystems around there got far healthier quickly. The Gulf oil spill that was like uh, eight years ago maybe now, they treated it with what are called chemical dispersants. These are harsh chemicals that attach to the oil and make the oil do one of two things, sink or break the oil up into little tiny droplets that can't be seen with the eye. It disperses them. So it either disperses them into small things or down to the bottom of the ocean. Does that get rid of the toxic oil? Does it also add an extra layer of toxic chemicals to the situation? Yes. But does it make the beach look prettier quicker? It does. But those ecosystems will suffer for decades. Unless bioremediation is done. Huge field of research that's taking toxic areas, using this method to change it into less toxic areas quickly. This is naturally done in wetlands. A lot of buildings who are looking at more sustainable methods of building are putting a wetland next door and having the water from their sinks and their toilets filtered through the wetland naturally to bioremediate it quickly without it having to go to a sewage treatment plant. Sewage treatment plants also are looking more and more using these methods. So they can be very widely used. All right, last little question about prokaryotes. What is the difference between a beneficial bacteria and a pathogenic bacteria? Is A, capable of causing disease, B, capable of living in an extreme environment like a hot hydrothermal vent, C, capable of living in a very salty environment, or D, one that is infected by a virus? What's the correct answer? A, good. So remember that a pathogenic bacteria is one that causes disease. So let's talk about the last word. All right. So viruses. Viruses are not living things. Viruses are very, very small particles. Let's look at the comparison.
comparison of size of viruses to other cells. Here's an example of one of the cells in your body, a eukaryotic cell, the cell that has a nucleus. Here's a Staphylococcus bacteria, a cyanobacterium, E. coli, and there's a virus particle. Viruses are teeny weeny. Now, even in comparison to staph, which staph often can travel in the air, if someone has a group A staphylococcus that causes strep throat and they just cough into the air, they can float in the air for between two and four hours. That's how small they are. Virus particles can float in the air between four and 16 hours. So filtration methods, I always keep the cold there open in the room. So if you see that little glass window, what that does is it sucks air from the room and out. So it recycles the air in here. General characteristics of viruses. They only have two major parts, or I should say they have two major parts. They have some kind of hereditary material, could be a DNA virus or an RNA virus. And then they have a protein coat surrounding that genetic material. We're gonna look at the complexity of different kinds of viruses. In a minute. So let's talk about viruses. Viruses, yeah. Viruses can't reproduce on their own. A virus needs to get into a specific host, into their cells, and the cells of the host are going to take their genetic material, incorporate it into their cell, and produce more viruses. So viruses without a host can't do anything. They don't have all the important things to undergo reproduction. Here's what some viruses look like. So here's a tobacco mosaic virus. Viruses are host and species specific, even cell specific. This is a virus that infects tobacco plants. The adenoviruses. These are common cold viruses that go around. Look at that. Geometric shape, DNA inside, like a proteins for attachment into their cells. Influenza virus, the flu virus, can be spread quickly. It's got a lot of attachments on it. And this is super cool a bacteriophage, very specific to certain bacteria. Does it look like an alien spaceship? So they can be pretty complex. The HIV virus. Very complex too. Look at all the layers. Got this layer, this layer, this layer, and lots of attachments into it. Oh shoot! You guys have a picture of this, so take a look at the picture. Right? Do you have a picture of this? Kleenex box. All right. I don't know why it's not coming up on my slide here, but take a look at the Kleenex box. So oh, there's a little something wrong because why? Nothing. It's pretty. B. It kills much less than what they claim. C. It kills 100% of viruses. D. Viruses aren't alive, so they can't be killed. What's the correct answer? Yeah. Viruses. It says it kills living things. So viruses are not living things. So what they will do is they will help capture. Viruses, right? If you're about to sneeze and you put Kleenex over your face, instead of the virus going out into the air, it's going to capture them, and then what are you going to do? You're going to throw it out, and then you're going to wash your hands for 20 seconds, right? So they help to capture viruses and put them out there, but they don't, the Kleenex itself can't kill it. Something like this will break down the proteins and the genetic material in the virus, but it's not alive, so you can't kill it. So you can break down a virus particle, but it's not alive, so you can't kill it. 
right, so a little bit about the characteristics of life. Viruses, there are certain characteristics that all living things can do. Viruses can't do them. They can't grow. They can only reproduce with the assistance of a host. They cannot reproduce on their own. They can't respond to stimuli, right? If the wind blows and they're floating around, they can't change directions and go flying off where they want to go. They just go. They can't maintain homeostasis, meaning that they can't maintain a regular state within their particles. They can't get energy. They can't seek out and get energy. They get what they get. They're not very complex in their organization. They're two parts, maybe a few parts. All right, so this one I don't agree with. It says they can evolve. They can evolve with, it's kind of like this. They can do this with the help of a host. They can only do this with the help of a host. So remember I talked the other day about the importance of maybe we don't want to take off our masks quite yet. And it's interesting because the CDC came out and said, we're not there yet. Even though the states are saying, take off the masks, live normal. But again, like this summer before the Delta surge, when they said, take off your masks, we had a Delta surge. We just had a surge. We were at peak two and a half weeks ago. And over ready to take off the mask? Not quite, because again, what viruses do, they get into their host. The host reproduces more of those viruses. The more people that get that virus inside of them allow for more situations where the viruses can mutate as we replicate them. So are we setting ourselves up for a situation with a very highly transmittable version of the COVID? by taking off our masks. We're setting ourselves up again. Is it gonna happen that we have another surge of some other variant? Maybe, maybe not. But do we wanna chance it? I don't. So that's just me. So good application of that. Okay, so viruses are not living things. They are particles. They are host specific and they are cell specific. So bacteriophages infect specific kinds of bacteria. If they happen to come in contact with that kind of bacteria, then they are selected for. If they don't come in contact with that kind of bacteria, nothing happens. So a bacteriophage can land on you and nothing will happen because it doesn't infect you. If it lands on you and a bacteria is on you that it can infect, it can infect that bacteria, but not you yourself. They are cell specific. So let's say that you are carrying a virus, a common cold virus, the adenovirus, one of them, and you're carrying it in your throat and you have a big cut on your hand and you cough onto your, your cut. Will your, your hand get the, the cold? No, right? Because this, these cells here are not susceptible to the common cold virus. But if you breathe really heavily and those virus particles get into your lungs, those cells in your lungs can get infected by the virus. So viral particles are very specific to the cells that they infect even in addition to the species they infect. About uh, 15, 12 to 15 years ago, the herpes virus, the sexually transmitted herpes virus, got a lot of news articles on it because with the popularity of beer pong, right? Set up cups and some kind of a triangle, throw ping pong balls, fill the cups with beer. 
if you throw it into the cup over there, the other team has to drink that beer. So people were sharing cups. A lot of people got the herpes virus on their mouths, the genital herpes virus on their mouths. And so when college doctor's offices, the health center, they all started reporting more and more cases of genital herpes, scientists started to go, what is happening? And they connected it to beer pong. What they found was that genital herpes could survive on any mucous membrane in our body, not just the genital mucous membranes. And they also found that in this, that the cold sore, if you get cold sores, that's a form of a herpes virus. Cold sore herpes could also be transmitted to genitals. So that if somebody were drinking out of a cup and got the cold sore herpes virus that they never had before, and then they had oral sex with someone, they could transmit that to someone's genitals. So many interesting research going on, so much interesting research. HIV virus only attacks the T helpers of our white blood cells. So very specific to what they attack to. This is what a bacterial phage looks like. On the right species of bacteria, they do this thing where the genetic material is in their head and then they get on there and they puncture like a needle, pump it into the cell. So here you can see the genetic material being pumped in. This is HIV. HIV will, it has similar glycoproteins to our own cell membrane. And so they merge together, bump in their DNA. Our cells, T helper cells, will manufacture more of them. Some cells will instinctually gobble them, endocytosis. They'll take those viral particles in and again, manufacture more of them. So how do we treat viruses? Viruses in general cannot be treated. Can you do things to limit the outbreak of a virus? Yes, you can. What we call these so I guess we can call them, kind of treating them, is antivirals. What they will do is they will tell our cells not to replicate these viruses so much. So that a virus which can't be cured of your body, and depending on the kind, like HIV for example, we can't knock it out naturally with our immune system, that what the antiviral treatments can do is keep them at a very low level to a point where you can live a very long, healthy life with these kind of medications. Now, what they're finding is that there have been discovered a few people that the antivirals have kept the, our cells from reproducing or a person's cells from reproducing the HIV virus so much to a point where they can't even detect it anymore in their body. But that's been individuals. They're not seeing that widespread. So they're thinking there might be either some mutation within some strains of the HIV virus, or it could just be certain people have certain genetics that can, their immune system can get rid of the virus. So interesting research going on in that area too. Mutations generally keep viruses effective but again, like my example, maybe there's some strains of HIV that are going to allow them to be attacked by our immune system. Well, what the help of the antivirals, I should say. So, kind of combination of maybe a mutation that helps us but doesn't help that virus with medications may make viruses go away. Now, when we're looking at COVID right now, 
we're probably going to live with some version of COVID forever. Now, we will hopefully live like this with masks and all of that, but vaccines are really, really important. When you keep hearing the term herd immunity, what that means is that at least about, about 75% to 90% of the people in the population are vaccinated so that it's very difficult for the virus to spread. Now there's always about maybe 2% of the population that because of autoimmune disorders, they cannot get vaccinated. So other people, so those people that like 2% who legitimately cannot get vaccinated, they're relying on the rest of the population to get vaccinated. There has never been a virus where herd immunity has been achieved naturally without the intervention of a vaccine, never. So there's a lot of frustration in the scientific community of people who are anti-vaccine because we're not going to achieve herd immunity. And the longer that we are, the quicker we take off our masks, the more susceptibility we are to more variants, which means more surges, and also means that because of the mutation ability of this coronavirus, could our current vaccine be outdated quickly? It could, which means that we could have a variant that comes around that is not working with our current vaccine vaccines, and so we have to start all over again. And so there's a lot of, unfortunately, this has become a political issue, which is, as a scientist, I am just absolutely incredulous as to how this became a choice. Um, I had somebody say to me the other day about, well, it's kind of like chicken pox. And I said, no, it's kind of not like chicken pox because chicken pox, it is regulated by the government that in order to go to school, you have to get the chicken pox vaccine. Everybody, the majority of people getting the chicken pox vaccine keeps chicken pox from spreading in the environment. It's not a choice, but it keeps us from having this outbreak. So there's some correlation in data we have. It's just all bizarre. All right, you recently got the flu. You go to the doctor and he prescribes antibiotics. Why? You guys should know this answer by now. Okay, antibiotics will kill the flu virus. Antibiotics will stimulate an immune response. Antibiotics are always given when a person has the flu. Your doctor is not trying to treat the flu virus, but any bacterial infection you get with compromised immunity as your body fights the flu virus. So what's the correct answer? Yeah. So as an educated consumer, if you, I mean, it's a little bit harder nowadays with the coronavirus, so, um, but even if you go in and you have COVID and they give you an antibiotic, your question should be, what bacterial infection are you treating? A lot of doctors will go, whoa, because I've done it a lot of times. I'm gonna give you this antibiotic. Well, you never took a swab or did a test for any bacteria. So what, are, what do you think I have? And then they get like, um, well, well, what? Yeah, so ask questions. Whenever you go to your doctor, if before you go, you have questions for them, write them down. Because you get in there, and a lot of times the doctors are so incredibly overworked, or the PA, and they start talking to you, and they're like, oh, okay. I'm always like, wait, 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 wait. I have five questions to ask you. And then they're like, I was like, can you get out of the doorway? You're making me anxious. Can you come in? Come back in the room so I can ask my questions. So it's a good way to get your questions. All right. Last couple of things here. Prions or prions, however you want to say it. These are proteins. They don't have genetic material. They can be super destructive. A lot of research needs to be done. These proteins typically cause degenerative diseases in brains. But there's 
no genetic material. So what does this protein have that can cause the brain to deteriorate? A lot of research needs to be done. There's a bunch of examples. One we haven't heard as much about because there's a lot more regulation is mad cow disease. Let me just quick talk about mad cow disease. So in England, what they have done to discover mad cow disease was they started to, after, in factory farms, right, cut all the meat off, and what's left are things like skin and bones and hooves and does anybody eat the cow brain in general? Usually not. We usually don't eat brains. So what they did with all of the skin and bones and whatever's left over that we weren't going to eat as meat and brains was they started to grind it up and then feed it to the cows in the farm. What do cows naturally eat? Grass. In factory farms, they often feed them corn, which is cheaper, but plants. Do cows eat other cows? No. Okay, so that's really disgusting, right? So they thought, well, instead of disposing of all of this material, we can grind it up and give it right back to our cows. Save us a lot of money. That's so unethical and disgusting. Um, and they didn't cook the brains, and so raw brains to the cows were causing the cows to have deteriorations in their brains, plus some of these prions were in the digestive systems of these new cows that were growing. So when the workers were trying to quickly cut the meat, some of it got onto the meat that people were eating, and then people got the cow disease. When they found out this whole process, they were like, oh, no, no, no. And that was shut down. So we don't hear about mad cow as much. But, um, you may have heard of Kuru. Kuru is a degenerative disease. It's found in tribes that live in Papua New Guinea. It causes, again, deterioration of the neurogenitive system. All right, so this is what I don't like about this, is that they will say that it is cannibalism, but it's ritual cannibalism of the dead. And what that means, I don't like the word cannibalism in here, is that this tribe has so much respect for their elders, for old people who have accumulated a lot of wisdom, that they believed that when an elder died in their community, that they would take the brain and eat it, little pieces of it, to try and absorb all of their wisdom. It's pretty beautiful, right? And the idea of like you're trying to get the wisdom of this person. But they didn't know that these prions could be transmitted through the brains and then cause them to have these neurogenic order disorders. So, um, a little background on it makes a maybe a little bit different story than just like, let's grind up the dead cow parts and feed it to the cows. That's not what they were doing at all. It's very different. All right, so, oh, sorry. I keep saying that's the last thing. So what do prions do? They make the brains shrink. They make more holes in the brains. They start to deteriorate brain tissue. The brain controls everything in your body. So things just start to go awry. You can see a few other disorders. The main take home here is don't eat brains. Learn anything today. Maybe that's it. All right. So why don't you all take a 10 minute break and then we'll get started.